Oh, I've used these. These may not be versions, but I could find versions. How do you want to do that? Um, well, we can, we can, uh, I think right now we can just talk about it and okay. then at the end I've got a, a camera too. I can just okay. take some pictures of that and then right. have it kind of as photographs, which sure. I think is probably the best, okay. uh, the best way. Um, so, and then how do you save your pre-writing your notes there? I mean, I have a bunch of these filling up my shelves and when, you know, right now I have way too many. Uh, a couple of times I've, um, sold or donated my papers to archives, okay. including Stanford and also at UC San Diego. And when mm -hmm. I do, I also include these. You include those? Mm -hmm. Okay. How many, do you have any idea how many you've probably gone through? Hundreds. Hundreds? Maybe thousands. Okay. Uh, is it, is it, do you always go for like the same kind of size or? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. I like, I like it to be able to fit in my purse okay. because I take it with me. And you know, sometimes I write at a cafe or you know someplace out in the world so yeah. I want to be able to stick it in my purse right right on the airplane whatever you know so it's nice if it's about this size and it's nice if it's flexible okay and it's nice if it's not expensive okay. yeah so, <laughs> um, so in, in, uh, in terms of your digital files what format do you usually work I in? docx Word, okay docx. Um, do, as you're working in those formats do you save drafts of the individual documents or do you save over those drafts? Do you, you know, I mostly save over which is not a good idea. But sometimes I have printed out drafts and okay. I I save drafts to a, you know, I probably don't save all of them, which mm -hmm. is not great, but yeah. I save a number of them and then eventually I'll probably give them to the library. Okay. Um, and then you're emailing them back yeah. so, so mm -hmm. that's sort of a draft. So as that well. also, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what are your naming conventions for your files? I just name it, I mean, whatever the title of the poem whatever is. Whatever the title. Yeah. And then if it's and a then, draft? You know, I don't, I mean, I, I number them. Sometimes okay. I'll have, you know, such and such a title one, such and such a title two, such. But when that gets too confusing, sometimes I'll just erase the old ones. So I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not a very, I'm not a very good curator of my own history <laughs> that way. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. Um, and you do save some paper copies of the yeah. drafts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you back up your digital files anyway? Not as much as I should. I mean, I backed. I do have a backup on a zip drive, but I haven't backed up for several months, mm -hmm. so I'm careless. And then when you're sending these uh, emails back and forth, or is it like a Gmail or some sort of? So it's yeah, like I'm. So, yeah, I, I mean. So you could go back and find them yeah, that way in some way. That's okay. true. Um, so you, so you're not using a Dropbox or any other cloud-based. No, I have Dropbox, but I'm not using it for this. I'm using it for a class that I'm team teaching with someone. Okay. But I could use it that way. I mean, it's something to think about. Yeah. <laughs> um, as a digital archivist, I might mm -hmm. have some suggestions. But, uh, if you ha do you ever have files saved in more than one location? Um, no. I mean, I... I well, the zip drive and the computer hard drive. Yeah, that would be it. Okay. As well, and paper, you know, uh, that would be it. <laughs> and then when you're finished with the piece, how do you? Is there anything special that you do for that file, or? No, I pretty much. You know, if I if I pretty much know which is the finest, uh, final version. Mm -hmm. And if I start to get confused, like I say, I just erase the others, which is probably a bad idea. But. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then the, the, what about the, um, like the final, like version, like the, the books and the, and the well, journals? Well, what happened, the, this is what I do. Okay. I'm going to take these out because this, these loose papers are not very significant. Those are, uh, copies that I took, uh, with me to give a reading somewhere, so that's why they're loose. Oh, okay. But, um, this is the manuscript that I'm working on now, uh -huh. and so I j these are really old-fashioned. These are called thesis binders. This one is all beaten up, uh -huh. but you can't really even buy them. You used to be able to buy them in stationery stores. Yeah. Linda Ginian in Berkeley knows, uh, I guess she has a whole bunch of them. I don't think even she can get them anymore, but uh -huh. she doesn't use them anymore, and she has a big stack, so she sends them to me. Oh, so this is really old school, but the way I use it is, um, it helps me order the, not only keep the poems for the manuscript, but I order the manuscript this way. I mean, I kind of mm. decide how, you know, what reads 
well by, you know, trying the poems out in different places yeah. within this manuscript so that I don't do that thing that I, you hear about writers doing about spreading the pages all over the floor or all over the wall or something, yeah. because I've already been deciding as I went along by where I placed them in this thesis okay. binder. And so will you be working on many poems at the same time? No, not okay. usually. Okay. Um, almost never. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, you know, obsessive when I start <laughs> something. I just work on it till I finish it. I mean, once in a while I give up on something for a while and set it aside mm -hmm. and go on to something else and then go back to it. Yeah. But I'm not actively working on two things at a time. Okay. Um, and so, just to kind of be clear then, so if you finished a piece, you would then go to your, you would print it out and then take it to this thesis mm -hmm. binder, put it in in a place where you think it may fit yes. with the rest that are that are working, and then mm -hmm. and then once you have what you would, how how do you know when you have a a collection then? Well, um, it used to be that I had a collection when I had enough poems for a book, but it seems as if I'm writing more now, so I get to make some more choices. I get to you know cut things cut a manuscript down, save mm -hmm. some things for later. Mm -hmm. So I get to make some decisions about um, how the poems work with each other, and it's kind of intuitive, you know, how they, um, do they, do they have a, do, do these poems have a particular tone, and maybe mm -hmm. when I get to the end of the manuscript, I think that there are some poems that seem to lead in a new direction, I set those aside to, for, to be the start of something new. Okay. Um. Have you ever received or sought out information about methods for digitally archiving your work? No. No? Okay. Um, then those are the short answer. And, mm -hmm. and I think we cover, uh, we did cover, I think, kind of the, the, ba the nuts and bolts of your current practice. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, so in this section, we're going to kind of talk about sort of three areas of your writing uh, and how, and talk about the different stages those went through and mm -hmm. changing over the course. Um, the uh, the uh, I and these are you know my sort of uh, definitions my sort of boxes so if they don't work for you just let me know but I sort of want to talk about the kind of compositional generative pre writing uh, place and then the revision place and then kind of organizational archival place which mm -hmm. is usually a little smaller at the end does do those work with your sure okay so how long have you been writing uh, professionally is the question well you know <laughs> um. For poets, that's a hard question. Yeah. I, how long have you been... Uh, Taking it seriously? Yeah, um, maybe that's a better yeah. way of putting it. <laughs> Since I was a senior in college, really. Okay. Um, I, I think I had my first poem published in a national magazine shortly after I graduated from college. And then I, I just continued to publish in magazines. I had my, my first book was published when I was 30. Mm -hmm. And I've been publishing books ever since. And I suppose that now you could say, or for, you know, when would it, if by professional you mean somebody who actually, you know, makes money and has a reputation, um, I guess I've been in that category maybe for 25 years or something. Okay. Um, I think I should change that question. Uh, <laughs> You're for poets, yeah. yeah. Um, would you please describe kind of the arc of your career, like where you started? And, and I would I would say, um, wait for a second. Or if you need to answer that, it's fine. All right, let me hear who it is. Sure. Probably I don't need to answer it, but if it's someone I really want to talk to. Bad timing. <laughs> it's okay. It, it ought to pick up after this. Or maybe they'll give up. Because I didn't answer. It's probably a, probably a sales call anyway. Yeah. Okay, what were you okay. saying? Um, so if you wouldn't mind uh, describing kind of the arc of your career from when you started sort of seriously writing okay. until now, um, just sort All of right. a general overview, so, you know, to okay. start the interview. All right. Um, I was interested in poetry since childhood. Mm -hmm. um, my mother read poetry to me. I wrote when I was a little kid, then I kind of stopped for a while, and then I started again in college. And uh, I was reading the poet Denise Levertov. Oh, I start. I grew up here in San Diego, actually, and I went to San Diego State for two years, and I was reading the poet Denise Levertov, and then I transferred to Berkeley, and she was teaching there. So I took a class with her, and 
through that experience I met my friend Ron Silliman, who's a poet, the one I send poems to, uh, who's still a friend of mine. And um, then I came back here and then I moved to San Francisco to go to grad school. And he was living there and through him and also through the grad program I met other poets. And there was, you know, San Francisco is a good literary town, so there was quite a community of, of poets in San Francisco. And I eventually was uh, friends with poets who became, came to be known as the language poets, scare quotes, <laughs> the West Coast language poets anyway, mm -hmm. which would include Barrett Lawton and Bob Perlman and Lynn Hagenian and Kit Robinson and Ron Silliman yeah. um, and Carla Harriman, among others. And, uh, you know, I went to a lot of reading series and participated in small press publications and um, had a very active literary life and, like I said, published in magazines and journals. And that my first uh, publisher was someone that we knew there. It was called The Figures Press and mm -hmm. his name was Jeff Young. And so that book came out in an edition of, you know, very small press, in an edition of 500 copies, which I, a lot, I gave a lot of them away to my friends and such. And then, um, at the end of the 70s, this was in the 70s, at the end of the 70s, uh, I got pregnant and it just didn't seem like we were going to be able to afford to keep living in San Francisco and raise a kid because, mm. kind of like now, I guess it's more extreme now, but, you know, there was, there was gentrification and yuppification going on then and yeah. suddenly the rents were getting out of reach for us, especially if we had a kid because you can't be so hand to mouth with a kid. And then my, uh, my mother lived here and was willing to babysit and also Chuck got an offer of a job here that would have benefits mm -hmm. and health insurance and also we ended up back here. I was not very happy to come back here because then, and this is going to get to a topic you like, then that was really isolating because that was before email, right? Yeah. That was, yeah. Even, that was even before I had a computer. So it just felt like, you know, kind of falling off a cliff. I mean, there were some poets here and I got to know them gradually. There was Jerome Rothenberg and David Anton and Michael Davidson, but um, not that many people of my generation, really. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I had lengthy correspondences actually on paper with the, the people back in San Francisco, not all of them, but some of them. Uh, I can't believe it now how much time we spent writing long letters out by hand or typing them on typewriters. Yeah. It seems surreal now that everything goes so fast. I mean, who would do that? But we did. And so some of those letters are in archives now. Mm -hmm. um, and meanwhile, I kept sending work out to, to journals. And uh, oh, Lynn Huginian in the Bay Area had a small press. And she published uh, my second book, which was a chat book called The Invention of Hunger. And what press is this? Uh, it, it was Tumba, T-U-U-M-B-A, kind of, uh, you know, a uh, letter press, mm -hmm. press. And then um, my third book, which was my second full-length book, was published by Burning Deck in Providence. Yeah. So that was my first kind of, you know, outside my immediate coterie yeah. publication. Still a small press, but... Um, and then I started publishing with the Los Angeles publisher Sun and Moon, who also published um, people like Lynn Hagenian and Charles Bernstein, mm -hmm. and um, you know was a, a, ver a very active press then. It changed. Uh, he he changed it to Green Integer, and ch I do have a book out on Green Integer too. But mm -hmm. the focus became for him became more republishing classics that had, you know, gone off copyright. So about that time, um, fortuitously, I got picked up by Wesleyan. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, I was already fairly well known, at least in the kind of small press world. I'd been in some anthologies. But I think that being published by Wesleyan and having a selected come out with mm -hmm. them in 2001 really kind of um, gave my career, so to speak, a boost. Mm -hmm. And um, things have just picked up since then, including my pace of writing, so that uh, since 2001, well, in 2001 I published two books. I published one with Green Integer and, called The Pretext 
And then the selected was Wesleyan, which is called Veil. Vale. Mm. And then in 2004, I had Up to Speed. In 2007, I had Next Life. In 2009, I had Adverse. In 2011, I had Money Shot. And then in 13, I had Just Saying. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a spurt. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, and then during that time, were you supporting yourself by teaching mostly? Yeah. Um, when we first came down here, uh, Chuck was one of the managers of the bookstore at San Diego State, and and I got um, about a year after we got here, I got a part-time mm -hmm. teaching job at UC San Diego, and at first it was kind of on and off, and then after that it was regular but adjunct, and um, I did that for many years. It wasn't until the early 2000s that um, I got a you know, real tenured job at, at UCSD. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess we want to kind of move into talking about the different uh, pro the different spots of processes for you and how it changed over the course mm -hmm. of your career. So in terms of like uh, when you first started writing seriously and were um, kind of uh, doing the pre-writing, the generative mm -hmm. work for these poems, how did, th well, how did that look? I mean, what, were what was the process for that? Well, I think I always used a notebook. Okay. Um, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't tell you exactly what the notebooks looked like way back then, but I always wrote by hand. Mm -hmm. um, I think I wrote by hand then, I'm sure I did, longer. Um, it took me longer to write a poem, and it also stayed in the handwritten phase longer. Because back then, when you left the handwritten phase, you had to go to a typewriter. Yeah. You're too young to know about typewriters. But they were enormously irritating, because if you made any mistakes, you had to either start over or put white out on it, or, uh -huh. you know, etc. And then you would make, you know, a copy. I mean, you would, you would print it out, and then if you wanted another copy, you would have to type it again, I mean, uh, right? So, yeah. I mean, there's a limit to that. Um, so you would, you know, you would kind of just do that when you thought you had a pretty much finished version. Mm -hmm. You might be wrong, but, you know, yeah. still. When you were working in the notebook, was it usually uh, in a certain spot, or could that be wherever you were? Was it just... Well, it w I did it a lot at home, but sometimes outside. Outside. And was it something uh, where you just certain had a, had a line or an idea that then you would write down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I often start that way. Then and still, you know, mm -hmm. um, so I can just something that I hear or see sort of piques my interest. It could mm -hmm. be something I read and I'll write down a passage or I'll write down something I overhear someone say, or even on television, you know, I could hear something that I write down. Um, and I kind of, you know, collect those things like a magpie until something starts to take off. Okay. And in the and then the sort of in the beginning part of your career then how at what point would you go to the typewriter? Like when would you kind of feel like, okay, this really needs to be typed? Well, I guess when I thought it was good enough to keep and good enough to maybe send a copy to mm -hmm. someone to see what they thought, either an editor or a friend. So that's pretty far along the yeah. yeah. So would you uh, were you doing revisions within the notebook as well? Mm -hmm. Um, and are, what type of revisions would, would, did it sort of start as? I mean, was it like, would you just be crossing out and rewriting, or would you... Uh, I, I don't know if I would cross out. I think I would just, you know, go to another page and rewrite. Okay. Um, um, and then, so when did the computer start to enter into this process? Um, let's see, when did I first get a computer? Um... The first thing I got was one of those IBM Selectrix that was sort of computerized, yeah. where you could make a no you could save and make a number of copies. Mm -hmm. But shortly after I got that, I was able to get my first computer, so that became sort of redundant instantly. Um, I'm tr trying to think what year it was. I mean, it was probably only when did you tell me when did desktops with with uh, word processing become available. It wasn't a word, it was like word perfect or word, yeah, something yeah. like so that. So like mid 80s, sort of? Or yeah, maybe, maybe um, later late, later maybe, that. I think I got the Selectric in the mid 80s and mm -hmm. maybe, you know, I probably got the computer by the late 80s and I don't think I got internet until, there wasn't internet that you could get until the early 90s probably. Yeah. It's incredible now to yeah. think, yeah. 
Um, how did uh, so how did how did that first computer come about? I mean, what, what did did you know a friend who had a computer and then go after that, or had you yeah, just I think uh, again Ron Silliman who worked in the computer industry. He worked as a, as a marketer in the computer mm -hmm. industry. He had one. I mean, he doesn't. He didn't live near me at that point, but we were in touch, and he had one before I did. But I guess, you know, really, I mean, everyone was getting it at about the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and then when, when you, so you got a computer, did it have an immediate effect on your practice? Did it start, did it start to integrate with what you were doing? Um, I, 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 I don't remember. I mean, I guess it was gradual. I still, like I say, work in notebooks, but I'm mm -hmm. sure that I started I started le going from the notebook to the computer sooner than I would have on a typewriter, I'm sure, but I don't have a clear memory of it. What I do have a clear memory of is how the internet changed things, mm -hmm. because then you could um, send someone something and say, what do you think? I don't know about this last line, what do you think? You know, I mean, you could have that kind of conversation. Yeah. And if you do that in a letter, which I did, but, you know, by the time you got a letter back, you'd already made up your mind. Right, right. So, right. <laughs> so in, the, in the early part, when you were sending these by letters, you, d you did that only a little bit and then didn't... Did, well, you I think I did it. I, I mean, I would, I would type something up and send it, and uh, uh -huh. I would, you know, usually to a couple of people, two or three people, and I would get responses back. Um, but it certainly, I mean, we're now we're so used to kind of this instant dialogue and instant gratification. Um, sometimes I think that that's, you know, maybe that's why I'm writing faster now, really, yeah. is, is the stimula stimulation of that. Um, because I'm, I'm still not, I guess I'm insecure enough that I'm not comfortable in saying something's finished until somebody has said that they at least think it's interesting. I mean, it doesn't always have to be Ron. Sometimes I send mm -hmm. it to somebody else, but mm -hmm. I have to have like somebody's approval. Not 100% approval, but like somebody has to think, oh, you know, this is okay. Yeah. Before I'll like decide that I'll put it in the book. And so that's sort of an integral part of the process. So mm -hmm. obviously if you can do that and get an answer in a day or two, well, you know, yeah. right. right. So then you, then, then I decide whether um, at that point, whether I still need to revise, you know. Um, so in the like it, like when the internet first starts coming mm -hmm. and you start working and and kind of sending these things back and forth, was it just Ron Silliman who was your kind no, of no? I, I, I used to more? I used to send them to more people, mm -hmm. Lynn Hagenian, um at first and Bob Perlman at first and Lydia da Lydia Davis the fiction writer mm -hmm. she's a friend of mine and later Fanny Howe too. Um, now I mostly just send them to Ron and once in a while to Lydia, mm -hmm. very rarely to Lynn Hagenian, but still once in a while, like maybe twice a year. So it's kind of that number of people has sort of shrunk. And what's what's the like, so you're looking for some sort of affirmation? Oh, yeah, of I guess so, yeah. Yeah, um, and do they give, I mean, what, do, you, do they give like very specific line feedback or, or they usually just give well, a sort Ron, of... Well, Ron does, I mean, okay. it, it all, you know, I could show you, I mean, this, I guess, is the kind of, my screen's dirty, but this is the kind of thing you might want to see. Um, so, let me go to my mail and then I'll go to my... Sure. Sent mail, and you can see some of this. Um, oh, this actually has to do with the internet. Um, I sent Ron a poem that mentions messages I was getting, this is actually in the poem, from mileage.com that I thought were funny. <laughs> so, well, so Ron writes back, if we're Oh no, he said. Oh yeah, he he said. Not sure you need you need the Q and A at the end. I had a sort of in interviewing myself bit at the end. Mm -hmm. Not sure you need the Q and A at the end. But other than the problems with the URL, he thought that it was that since I was saying mileage.com, which he says is a phishing site. Yeah. He thought that if that was ever published in an online journal and somebody hid on it clicked it that I could be in trouble for that, which I don't know if that's true. He says, you know that mileage.com is a phishing site. It sends malware to your PC if you follow through. 
And then I, at some point, wrote back and said, I, I don't do that. Um, and so, you know, that's the, some of the kinds of... So, so there, I am, um, there, there I am sending something to him and having a correspondence with mm -hmm. him. And um, let's see. Here I am sending something to myself just to kind of preserve it. Uh -huh. Same poem, but it has a different title at that point. There's mileage.com lit up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it lights up if you do it. It doesn't on my computer, but it does if you do it on the on iPad. Apple, yeah. right. So did you write that on your iPad? Well, I mean, I st like always, I started here, and then okay. I moved it to the iPad, and then I moved it to the computer. Okay. But, but I was sending, I think um, I start writing usually, or I, I write in the morning sitting over there, and I don't want to be running up and down stairs, so I'm apt to just go, you know, this looks good enough to kind of type, so I'll type it here. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I don't yet feel like sharing it with someone, I'll just send it to myself. Okay. Because that's a way of saving it. And that's when you could move it to the yeah. other computer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when did you start using the iPad? Um, gee, again, uh, I got an iPhone maybe three years ago, and I got the iPad maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know, time's a blur. Okay. Um, so you've been... Uh, it's it's been an old one, though. So it's been a couple of years, mm -hmm. th two or three years. Uh, did you ever work on the iPhone, too? No, too tiny. Too small of a... Yeah. Of a typing um, mm -hmm. format. Um, do, uh, so then I guess back to the, the sort of revision sort of uh, mm -hmm. correspondence, it, do you think that, um, why do you think Ron Silliman has kind of been the, the constant of all that? Well, because he's very confident about what he says, first of all, and he's also very specific. Mm -hmm. He doesn't always say why he thinks what he thinks, which drives me crazy, <laughs> but it gives me something to bounce off. You yeah. Know? And uh, is he is he very prompt in responding? Often, not always. Okay. Sometimes it's right away. Sometimes it's not for days. Depends on how busy he is. Yeah. You know. And does he reciprocate? Does he send you things? Over? He never has. He doesn't like to do that. Other people <laughs> have. So you know that's fine with me. But um, I mean, he writes really, really long kind of book length things. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't revise much. He doesn't revise like I do. So. Yeah. Um, he just has a different kind of practice. And, you know, he's, he seems to be very invested in his own certainty about things more than I am. Um, but some other people will send me things. Lydia Davis sends me things, and Fanny mm -hmm. Howe once in a while sends me things. And how did you kind of develop your revision process, kind of from the beginning, I guess? Um, well, I guess, you know, I was just always looking for the best word, for instance, and it didn't always come to me right away. Mm -hmm. But also, I will get, I will just get parts of things that I know that they're not finished, you know, mm -hmm. and then I just try to see what, what can connect, and I'll, I'll, you know, go one way, one direction, and try to connect, you know, B to A, and then B doesn't quite connect to A, so then I'll go on to C and see if that connects to A, you uh -huh. know? And has that been pretty constant throughout? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, have there been any big changes in the way you've approached um, the kind of pushing the poem to its finished state throughout the way, the time? Well, I bet there have, but you know, I, I'm, well, as, I'm as much of a stranger to my 24-year-old self as you are almost. <laughs> <laughs> well, but uh, so I mean, you did mention though that that with with the internet and with mm -hmm. the sort of uh, email becoming more, it's yeah. giving more easy, more easily available correspondence, mm -hmm. you did start to speed up yeah. in the work. Mm -hmm. um, and do you think that's the only reason, or do you think it's also have something to do with, with uh, maybe moving on to more of a national scene? It could be that. It could be knowing that I have a supportive publisher. Mm -hmm. It could be just practice, you know, just yeah. that I have a better idea of what works now, you know, I yeah. don't know what works for me. Um, and I know you don't, uh, I think in, in, in one of your other interviews you said how you, you don't really have like kind of any intentions in revising your work, but are there, um, are there like primary things for different pieces that you're driven by? Like are some driven more by sound, some driven more by meaning, some driven more by connecting the parts to the whole or, or, or disconnecting well, all, the parts to the whole? All of those things equally. Uh -huh. you know? I mean, I am very interested in sound and sounds certain sounds can really bother me or, you know, mm -hmm. or I can get stuck on wanting to have a certain sound. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, and sir, I mean, meaning is important to me too. Yeah. And I mean, with the, in terms of 
connecting parts because, you know, as you know, if you've looked at my work, it's often in sections. In sections. Yeah, absolutely. And so the sections might be written on different days, often are, you know. Uh -huh. So, and they often come from different sources or different uh, inspirations. <laughs> and and um, so then, you know, the the question is how 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 they link in. Yeah. And you kind of, at least if you're me, I shouldn't say you, but I, um, I want there to be some kind of possible perceptible connection, but I also want it to be surprising. I want it to yeah. kind of go somewhere that you didn't expect it to go or that I didn't expect it to go. So um, sometimes the first thing I come up with is too obvious and sometimes what I come up with is too random and you know it's like mm -hmm. it's like uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. <laughs> has, has that sort of looking for that surprising turn or, or idea been a constant throughout? I mean has that been something that's been driving you since you started writing? I've probably become more conscious of it, but I but I think so, yeah. Okay. And how do, uh, so could you talk a little about how, uh, I, mean, I mean, as you say, a lot of your poems are in sections, and how those sections kind of come to be a whole, like, w I mean, could mm -hmm. there be several different days, and, and then in between mm -hmm. those different sections become different poems? Ah, uh, sometimes that happens, okay. yeah, yeah. I is, mean, mm -hmm. Is it just a, do you just start to see connection, I mean, I, I guess it's connect, that's sort of a, yeah, I, and sometimes I have an idea of what I want mm -hmm. vaguely, but I don't. But I don't know exactly where I'm going to get it or what the specifics are. But I sometimes I have a, a just gut feeling about the direction that I want to go, um, and other times I don't, and I just have to be surprised and just mm -hmm. know that I want something and should keep my eyes open for it. And um, do you? I guess is it the? I mean, there's a certain point where you say within the within the emails you get some sort of affirmation, but then. Personally, do you when do you do you feel like a, a sense of like oh that's surprising? I mean, is there like an like an aha moment? I mean, yeah, okay. sure. Um, yeah, you have to please yourself first. I mean, yeah. you know, and I think one reason that I tend to send the poems out is that I'll be dissatisfied. I tend to I mean I will be dissatisfied and, and fool with things forever mm -hmm. unless somebody goes. Hey, that's good, you know. I yeah. I mean, I'll go. Maybe it's not good. Maybe I should do something else. So, you know, I think that's why I need I need somebody to give me a kind of end point or say, you know, cut it out now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I know, but sometimes I I can be insecure and just fiddle. Right. Um. And then I guess is there is there any way uh, do you once it, the poem kind of reaches like the thesis mm -hmm. binder stage is there any time that you start to see the ways those are working and go back and revise there, or once it's there, it's usually kind of off limits? It's Well, I wouldn't say it was off limits, but it, yeah. I don't usually revise then, but I have. I mean, it has happened okay. that um, I've suddenly seen how something could be better and, you know, I've gone away from it, gone back to it and went, oh, that could be better. But I would say that, you know, maybe one time in 20. Okay, so a more rare. Case. Yeah. And then when did you start using the thesis binders? long time ago, um, maybe 20, 25 years ago. Okay. They used to be easy to find, but now, like I said, they're antique, old school. Yeah, and before, <laughs> when you were first putting your first collections together, how did that work? How, did, how, how was that looking? I might have had one even then. I'm Because I'm, okay. I'm, I'm everyone used to. This is what used to happen, people. Everyone used to bring these to a reading and just read from them. Uh -huh. I don't even do that anymore because they're too heavy to carry. I just print them out. But um, that's what people used to do, okay. so everyone had one. Okay. Um, so we've talked about how other, the other people, uh, is there any other role that other people play in the process of your revi revisions? Are there any other people that are important to those, to the kind of finding the finished pieces? Well, I think, um, not really, except sometimes my editor mm -hmm. uh, gives me a little bit of guidance, not about individual poems, but about um, the order of poems within a manuscript. I usually think I know, but sometimes she has a different idea that she runs by me, and we consider that. Okay. Um, and then uh, sort of moving on to the sort of organizational, what I call organizational mm -hmm. archival, um, and we've kind of covered some of this, but I mean, when you were first, so in the, in the early days before the computers, when you kind of hit that, what you would say a final piece is, you mm -hmm. send it out, would you also like keep a... A printed page. Oh sure. Okay, and that would be in the th in that. And in then, the thesis how would you uh, communicate with your publisher with those? 
Um, but well, I suppose we had to communicate by by snail mail. How else was there? <laughs> right, and so you would you would have you would collect those all, and would you make a copy of it before you send it off? I mean. Oh yeah, yeah. I probably Xeroxed it. I mean, there were Xerox machines. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and uh, then I guess in the, the, once things were published and, and things, did you start to kind of keep an archive an archive of your own work at that point? I mean, did you have like boxes with your with your papers in it even at the beginning, or did that kind of start to come more gradually? Uh, that came more gradually. I mean, I wish that I had kept my letters right from the beginning because I had a letter from George Oppen and mm. I had a letter from Robert Creeley. It really took me a while to realize. Um, that this was all going to be worth anything, I th and it it yeah. it took seeing some of my friends the way some of my friends took it seriously, like Lynn Hagini and and, yeah. and organized things and treated it as if you know it it was all worthwhile. Yeah. Um. But I didn't you know I didn't come from an intellectual family or background and and so you know it wasn't natural to really for me and right. I had to learn it. Okay. Um. I guess I, I guess I'm interested in that and, and like how did how so you, the lessons were just from watching them do that or, or were they from the conversations I mean did you just sort of notice that Linda Jennian sort of had a had like kept things better or I mean well I think at some point she sold her papers and I went oh <laughs> people sold their papers and they get money <laughs> and and also um, I would notice that she wrote letters as if as if she was writing for an archive. I mean, she would kind of give you the backstory that you already knew, and I'm going, who, sh wait, who's she talking to? <laughs> the archive. <laughs> <laughs> I one of the correspondents, but that's a good point. Yeah. Um, uh, and so I guess I still don't do, do that. But yeah. I think now, I think email has ended pretty much ended that for most people. Now people just shoot off emails, and so I don't know what's happening to archives. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I mean, is there any way that you try to save your emails? Are there any that you... I have saved emails um, and even printed them out and given them to libraries. Um, uh -huh. But I just... I think uh, Ron saves everything, so everything I send to him gets saved. That's how I look at it. He's, <laughs> he's my archivist. I mean, I only... You know, there's only so much space in my house. And oh, yeah. I know you can save things on your hard drive and give your hard drive to a library, but God knows what's on my hard drive. So, so far, I just, I mean, what I do now is if there's anything that seems especially interesting or valuable, I'll print it out and keep it. Okay. Um, and then do you, like, when you first started writing the emails back and forth in, in kind of like general correspondence, what were the, what was the sort of tenor of those? What, did it still feel more like a letter? I mean, did you mm, notice yeah. a gradual change? Yeah, I mean, sure. Letters were letters, and... Uh, <laughs> And I should go look up my old letters. I could. I could go to an archive and look at them. Um, yeah, I think you would. You would talk about various things, how your how your life was going, and then you would say, "And by the way, I wrote this." You, would, mm -hmm. you know, include it. But you would be catching up. Sure. Now yeah. we catch up all the time. You know. Right. So you're kind yeah. of constantly. Mm -hmm. Are you on any social media things? Do you do? I'm on Facebook. You do the Facebook. And I'm also on Twitter, but I don't tweet much. <laughs> follow whatever going yeah, on. Yeah, a few of, things, a yeah. Bit. But I, I, sure, I'm on Facebook, I, and that's how I get some of my news. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do you remember when you, like, your first email or any of that sort of thing? Or I don't <laughs> remember my... Nostalgic, but... I don't remember my first email. I, I remember that Ron said I had ramped up quickly. <laughs> That was flattering, so I remember it. Did you were you first uh, given an email because of your work, because of UCSD? Was that your first? No, um, no, I got it on my own. Um, and and when my son was still living here, and he helped me set everything up. I mean, you know, he was probably fourteen or something. So, mm -hmm. so that's why I have a really stupid. I mean, my university address. I guess you wrote me at my university address. Or or yeah. did you write me? Okay. I think both. You gave me the other one because you were Which is really it. stupid because it's R-A-E-A-100-900. I shouldn't say that anything my son said was stupid, but he was only about 14. And I yeah. guess he thought that was... I feel like I have, I'm have. i James Bond or something <laughs> and, with, with that email address, but yeah. whatever. Um, uh, let me see here. So, I mean, it seems to me like in, in sort of talking about the, the, the progression... Um, 
that the main difference, the main change has really just been the kind of speed with which email allows you to kind of get to a point where you think things are, are, are solid enough for a collection. Yeah. Um, are there anything, is there anything else you can think of that uh, really changed as, as technology changed? Or do, do you feel like for the most part, um, not that the typewriter and the computer are the same, but that you were use, you know, the, the relationship between the notebook and those sort of mm -hmm. typing procedures were similar. Well, I was never a great typist, so I was always making mistakes, so it was always yeah. frustrating. Of course, sometimes I hate my computer, too. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's not a question of the typing issue, but just, you know, we all hate our computers. Yeah. They're slow, they, you know, whatever. So sometimes I'm yelling at my computer, what did you just do? Chuck, you know, it'll, it'll lose a document, or I'll go, what? I did what? It's gone, you know? Yeah. So. I have a kind of adversarial relationship with it, but I use it all the time. <laughs> and then if you lost something, then you, you would go back, what would be your first move? Well, supposedly you can hit, I think it's Control X and get it back, but that doesn't work very well for me. Um, would you go back to an email? I mean, like if you... Well, if I'd send an email, sure, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what's, what's, what does like the revision, like if it's just you on, the, on the, your, your upstairs computer, what does that revision look like? I mean, are you moving things around a lot or are you, is it more just sort of reading and then deleting and, and uh, inserting new words? Yeah, that would be it. Mostly. Do you read them out loud to yourself? Yeah, okay. always. Is that, do you, when do you start doing that? In the notebook. In the notebook. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, so can you talk a little bit more about how that works? I mean, is it something that you're, like, as you're writing the first line, you're reading out loud, or is it like you finish well, I'd, pr I'd probably, well, <laughs> in between, not the first line, but I'd probably have to have a few lines be before I thought it was worth reading them out loud. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. I should get to something bad that changed a lot. Um, but then that would be embarrassing. Um, you're only recorded by, like, four devices, so. Yeah, I, right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know what to do here, because the, uh, the things that I start out writing change so much. Let's see, um, I, can, I can get to a poem that's finished, and I can read little bits from my journal that were the beginning of it, okay. I guess. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, although it's, the beginning is going to be very bad. <laughs> so you can, Give the rest so of you the can stand that. <laughs> um, Okay, so this is in two parts, and I think this part is working on, see. I to, uh, first of all, it's very hard to read my handwriting, even mm -hmm. for me to read it when I'm looking back at something I wrote a while ago now. Um, Okay, so there's, I'm, is it okay if I read the poem, or is that a waste of time? No, absolutely. Okay, so this is called Particular. Rough, squat, bent, crabbed, cranky. A crank is a person who is over-enthusiastic about a particular topic. To be particular is to be choosy. A particle is a body whose extent and internal structure, if any, are irrelevant. You there, let's dispense with these properties of matter, such anachronistic clothes as ghosts wear. Let's be mirrors, facing mirrors, fall in love. Okay, so here's some, some build up to that, um, which is really doesn't sound like a poem at all. Um, okay, this is embarrassing, but okay, to love you show yourself willing to erase yourself. Make yourself blank together for a few moments, see this is just prose, in order to reflect the other. That ended up being, you know, let's be mirrors facing mirrors, fall in love, right? Oh. Two, two cloudless skies, no earth between. The young do it best. Now everyone has lost the trick of it. For love they empty themselves, and then I guess I'm rewriting. For love they empty themselves, mirrors reflecting mirrors. So that gets a bit of that. The young, two cloudless skies, nothing between, not like us, condensed into these peculiar shapes. 
For love, they empty themselves, and this is starting over mm -hmm. again, until their mirrors reflecting mirrors, the young, unlike us, who have assumed these peculiar shapes, they forget everything until their mirrors reflecting mirrors, the young, open channels, and I took that out eventually, the, through which charges flow, not us, they forget everything until their mirrors reflecting mirrors, they fall in love. The trick the young can do, unlike us with our definite opinions and habits, these properties and mass change, spin, so that gets to where I was talking about a particle is a body, who's ex so that's like subatomic, right, whose yeah. extent and internal structure, if any, are irrelevant. Let's dispense with these properties of matter. So anyway, here I'm starting to get into that. These properties and mass, charge, spin, are like the clothes that go swear. Well, that gets into here, except there's, I, there's no simile, it just goes, let's dispense with these properties of matter, such anachronistic clothes as ghost wear, let's be mirrors, facing mirrors. But you, you can see how some of that yeah. worked into that, right? No, absolutely. Right? And yeah. then, so uh, it, it kind of, it moves, I mean, not quite chronologically, but, mm -hmm. but sequentially, and mm -hmm. you just sort of, it's not, it, and it's not even a winnowing, it's sort of an addition and subtraction mm -hmm. and addition, mm -hmm. and then... Now, this is stuff that Ron, not even Ron Silliman sees, because I wouldn't send anything that in Koei to anyone. Okay. So, now you're seeing something. <laughs> you're hearing something that nobody has heard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's fascinating. And, and then, so, at a certain point, when you move to that, does that sort of stop in the journal, in the, in the notebook? Yeah. In the next poem? I mean, one, once I move to this, then I'm, I, I, I seldom go back to the notebook. Okay. And, but then, like, the next page, then, would be the next poem that you work on, essentially? Yeah, unless, yeah, Unl unless I decide that, say, the last part of this is bad and start off, then I might start over in the mm -hmm. book. Um, and so the type of revision then that, that happens on the, on the iPad, I mean, it's not as easy to kind of move things around there. I mean, what, what usually occurs? Well, fortunately for me, yeah. my poems don't have a lot of words and they have short <laughs> lines, so I can just yeah. back back things out and start over. I just do that. Okay. Okay. Um, is there any sort of formatting that you use in, I mean, either here or on your PC that you, like, you've kind of developed? Like, do you have, like, a certain font that you use or anything like that, or is that not really a concern of yours? It's not really a concern. I okay. mean, I wouldn't want to hate, hate a font, but I'm okay <laughs> with the standard font. Yeah. Um, and then I guess I'm, I'm wondering then, before there were, before you had the iPad, you would just take the notebook up to your computer and, and write it down there? I mean, yeah. that would be the, the sure. thing? of course. So it's almost like an ease of, of uh, place, almost, yeah. than anything else. Yeah, absolutely, because I'm comfortable in this room, and uh, I, I will just stay there with my coffee playing around here for quite a while. So I think that's just, you know, habit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do you use the, like, so when you're connected up there, is, is the internet always connected as well? Are mm -hmm. you always connected to the internet? Yeah. Are you doing any sort of, are you using it for research purposes or reference purposes when you're up yeah, there? Yeah, I mean, uh, for in terms of um, my teaching, okay, because I'm preparing to teach this class I've never taught before, and I'm going to be teaching it with a guy, uh, with a physicist, where it's called Poetry for Physicists, and, and he's been getting a lot of press lately. I don't know if you've seen it. Brian Keating, he was involved with the discovery at the South Pole. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So, um, and he's interested in poetry. So anyway, I'm doing research for that, and I was just, um, you know, I'm, I'm using some um, ancient poets like Lucretius, uh -huh. who, who wrote about science, you know. I yeah. mean, he wrote the ancient Greeks like Lucretius, but, you know, knew about, or, or not knew, but hypothesized the existence of atoms in the void and you know so I'm, I'm was just doing some research about him and and uh, on the computer and then printing it out and yeah so sure and yeah um yeah no I, when i read about the when i was reading your work and read about mm -hmm. this kind of discovery of or confirmation of the inflation theory i was mm -hmm. like i would really like to see a poem by Ray and try about this well it we turns out he's with? my bud so oh yeah know. that's awesome <laughs> yeah that's a good, uh, and yeah. how long have you been in conversation with him? I dedicated a poem to him in this book. Um, so I've been in conversation with him for, I don't know, maybe three years. Mm -hmm. uh, so the poem called Accounts is based on a conversation that we had. Here is Accounts. And what are his books? Here it is, see, for Brian Keating. 
Oh, cool. Okay. Well, I don't think so. I, I mean, he's an astrophysicist. They don't write books. You mentioned somebody <laughs> that, like, there was a, some, like, some more popular science writer that you were reading. Uh, oh, I read, you know, I read Brian Greene, different, yeah, that's, different I was, Brian. I was getting them confused because yeah. of the Browns. Uh-huh. Um, and how long has that been a, a sort of subject of fascination for you? I think I, I start, the first time I did anything with um, particle physics was really when it first became popularized, like when the Tao of physics came out in mm-hmm. the 80s. And at first I thought it was just kind of absurd, uh, all of this, the particle zoo, and I thought it was just like how many angels can stand on the head of a pin <laughs> or whatever, you know, but I was still reading it and sort of interested in it. And then um, I guess starting with my book Up to Speed in 2004, I've, uh, you know, taken a more sustained interest in it. Mm-hmm. And so what, what's this class going to look like overall? Do you have like a, a shape to it? or? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I've never team taught before, but uh-huh. you know, some days I'll be talking. I've, I've chosen poems that either have something to do with cosmology or physics uh, in some way, or that have to do with objectivity and subjectivity and theories of mind, mm-hmm. or then in a different way, um, going off of kind of chaos theory where uh, complexity can be devel- can grow from from the iteration of simple rules. I'm uh, using some poets like well, like Ron Silliman and like Jackson McClough and like Christian Book, the mm-hmm. Insta Ulipo poet. Yeah. Um, who use constraints or rules to generate poems, you know, and have math in their poems, in, yeah. you know, not as a subject, but as a generative principle. Right. So I'm doing some of that. And then Brian is, you know, he he likes poetry, but he's, you know, he's, he's, he's not exactly up to the avant-garde, shall we say. <laughs> he likes sonnets and, and such, so we have a, a bit of that. Okay. And will, will it be a uh, class in which you ask the students to write, or is it more of it's a It's not really a writing class. Or? I mean, they're going to write one poem, and they're going to write a couple of essays, and there's there going to be a couple of tasks, and it's mostly a reading and discussion course. Okay. So, and it's next fall? No, it's in the spring. It starts in oh, a week. Oh, right. The sp- it the starts next sorry. Tuesday. You guys are on quarters, so, <laughs> yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, let me see here. We're fairly well along, almost done, actually. Um, are there any other? Uh, so I mean, you know, these are kind of. I, I don't know how far you want to get into this, but like in terms of teaching, when did when did that sort of email and computers start to kind of take over that? I mean, it's sort of like 2000s, early 2000s. Um. Well, email. I think that was in the 90s, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And has that? Do you feel like that's? changed how you approach students and how you approach your classes? Well, yeah, I know your students can always find you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it certainly made it easier to write a syllabus having a computer. Yeah. And you can, you know, you can e- constantly email your students and remind them what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I think it's made, just made it easier for everyone. Mm-hmm. Is there a way, do you see any sort of uh, differences in understanding of your students now as to your students like say 15, 20 years ago? Um, well, I think that, you know, that certainly students stu- students do gradually change. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it's, when you teach young people, you kind of um, sort of stay in that world. You hear their expressions. I'm not saying that I'm a digital native by a long shot, but you know, you you uh, sort of hear the way they talk and you get yeah. a bit of their mindset and you, you know, you know their lingo and in a way that um, I think when I retire I might miss that. Yeah, yeah. Um. But still, if something goes wrong with my computer, I have to get my son to help me. <laughs> so it, that's actually, I've found that this has been kind of a theme. It, it, you do have somebody who comes in and helps you if you have any computer well, problems. Yeah, he lives in Seattle, but he's walked me through things on the phone. Okay. Um, and has he set up, did he set up your computer when you first yeah. got it and stuff like that? Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And he was 14. <laughs> He's built a computer, even. Oh, he, is he like in? Is he like working in the? If he's in Seattle, is he working in the computer? No, he's or? he's a scientist, but okay. he's not in the computer industry. He's a biologist. Oh. Um. So uh, I'm 
fairly well through the, we've covered pretty much what I'd like to cover. Uh, I do have my blunt questions at the end. So do you, I mean, are, is there any sort of overarching thing that you think have, has changed with the advent of computers in terms of writing? I mean, like, do you see like, so, like a sort of maybe change in tone, a change in tenor, a change in mm. ideas that, that have Well, been yeah, I mean, um, well, the fact that I just recently wrote a poem that references mileage.com. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I could, if I can, I could bring up that section of it for you but anyway, because it's certainly something that would not have been written had there not been computers. It goes, protect your identity, says mileage.com, three times today, as if it knew something. I may want to fly cheap, cruise in luxury, buy a walk-in tub, and burial insurance. <laughs> you know how they try to sell you things. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that gets into the content of the work. And then there are groups of poets who work in that realm kind of specifically and almost yeah. exclusively, like the Flarf poets, for instance, just do what they call Google mining. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. What's, what do or, you and, and also, of course, there are digital poets. Uh, there's digital poetry where people uh, write poems, especially for the computer where the, I don't know, the words fall off the screen at different rates and such. Yeah. Do you do, you do I mean, if you're going to like be reading poems for, for whatever reason, do you find that you're reading them a lot more on your screen than you used to? I mean... I don't like to read on the screen. Okay. I mean, I do read things on the screen, but if, if I'm judging a contest or something, which I mm -hmm. sometimes do, I ask for hard copies. Or if I get them on the screen, I print them, because yeah. I just don't like to read on the screen. I mean... I, for, I don't want to sit up there in a hard chair. I don't want to look at that light. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's pretty um, <laughs> typical. Um, okay. <laughs> Good, right. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. This was painless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>